Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow, and it is my uh, great pleasure today to have John Hathaway, who um, manages uh, a number of gold funds at, at Sprott, and we're going to be giving you a lot of information on Sprott. I'd like for you to certainly take a look. I think if you have an interest in gold or gold equities, I would certainly encourage you to take a look. And during the the interview today, you're going to see where we will definitely be showing you how to get in touch with John and his firm. But John, I want to welcome you. Thanks for visiting with us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ted. Look, uh, really, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah. You know, we uh, last time we saw each other, we were in the cold of veil doing a symposium. We were wearing uh, <laughs> warm, very warm clothes. Yeah. <laughs> and the one thing I like about John uh, relative to some of the uh, late comers in the investment business is uh, and John, I'm not going to, he's been, over, he's I'm been, definitely in, not a late comer. Yeah. <laughs> he's been in the business 52 years and he's even a guy that would remember Howard Ruff, uh, and the yeah. Ruff, wow. <laughs> am I right? Past. <laughs> Had, uh, he was a big gold bug though, for sure. Back in the day in the seven, late seventies and early eighties. Okay. But anyway, John, I want to get into a couple of things. Number one, you have a great slide talking about your outlook on gold and gold equities. Um, kind of give us a, a, a macro micro on that sort of look. Sure. Um, I think it has to do with this, the standoff between the fed and the financial markets. Um, and I think that's where we are right now. It's kind of a stare down. The Fed has committed itself to stopping inflation, uh, which they didn't see coming, and but which they caused. Um, and um, last week, President Biden, Chair Powell, and Janet Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary, had a meeting, and it was kind of like Kabuki theater. And it was all scripted, uh, but there was no real news that came out of it, other than the fact that Biden said, "Well, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to leave the Fed independent. Um, they know what they're doing." That was something to that effect. Um, I think the translation is, if inflation doesn't come down, it's not my fault. It's all on the Fed. <clears throat> and what's interesting about that meeting <clears throat> is that. There was no real news out of it other than the photo op. But interestingly, uh, Jamie Dimon, the chairman of JP Morgan and, and uh, some of the other too big to fail banks, not long after that meeting said, brace yourself for a hurricane. That was, those are the words of Jamie Dimon. But only a week or so before that, he said the economy's in good shape. So what I think that meeting was all about was kind of paving the way building political consensus for uh, an expected period of economic weakness. So that's, that's how I would set the, set the tone of where we are today. But uh, the real, the, my, my view is that they don't have a clue of what to do. Um, uh, Powell is a, basically a, is a politician, former investment banker. And uh, as I said, they were the cause of the um, inflation and um, uh, uh, but they know that what they're doing will cause economic weakness. The big question is how much can the administration stand uh, politically going into the midterm elections? Because I don't think there's any instant gratification. Now, I had a, a call the other day with uh, our mutual friend Lacey Hunt um, of Hoisington Management. And um, as you know, Lacey is, is an expert on these matters, monetary uh, policy. And um, his view, and uh, this, this has been my view, but it, coming from Lacey uh, with his credentials, I think strength, strengthens the point, is that uh, there's been so much liquidity created over the last couple of years between the growth of M2 and uh, handouts to um, uh, consumers uh, during the pandemic, fiscal, uh, easy fiscal policy, that we have built up uh, such an amount of liquidity that may take two years to get back to trend line. And I don't think in the world of politics, two years is like eternity. And the, the, the ability to um, uh, 
keep the hand on a hawkish policy isn't there. So I am in the camp that they will cave in and pivot probably before the end of the summer because of the, uh, and what we're gonna see is maybe some moderation of the high rate of inflation, although this Friday is anybody's guess uh, for the CPI. But maybe over the summer, uh, uh, a little bit of slack will appear in the economy and maybe that will cause the place to come down, but it's not gonna go away. And, and so where we are with gold, getting to the point, I guess, of this whole monologue is that we're kind of at the point where the Fed really doesn't have a dial anymore. It's an either an on or off switch. They're either switching off the economy and crashing financial assets and the economy, or they're, they're crying uncle and caving in, which will open the door to more inflation. And I think either outcome is positive for gold. Gold does well. Uh, it actually, year to date, it's up a little bit, um, while the S&P is down 12 or 13 uh, percent. So it, it's, it's shown that it can be uncorrelated and protect capital during difficult times in the markets. And if the Fed, Fed cries uncle and pivots, my guess is before the end of the summer, we're off to the races and I think we'll see new highs in the gold price, which would be around $2,200. So that's that's kind of the setup for anything else we'll talk about. And you know, uh, John, you have a great slide about asset class performance, gold leading the pack. It goes back to 2000, and I'm sure this will catch most people by surprise about comparing it to the S&P, the, uh, the, the agri U.S. aggregate bond and the dollar. It's a super slide though. You might talk about that. Yeah, I think it would come, as you said, it'll come as a surprise. Gold is actually performed in line, depends on when you actually take that snapshot or better than the S&P over the last 20 years. Uh, and the why 20 years? That's when they, that's what I call the sort of dawn of radical monetary policy, uh, ultra low interest rates under Greenspan, QE under uh, Bernanke and continued by um, uh, Yellen and, and now uh, Powell. So yeah, gold has actually done quite well, even though it has kind of a bad name. And you had a, uh, you have a slide on near-term performance, just the first quarter, which you've already mentioned, but uh, in looking at that slide, obviously it's done better than both stocks and bonds, but um, don't you, I'm asking a question here and it's not a, it's not a statement, but uh, hasn't there been periods when right at the end of a bear market, not in the beginning, but right at the end of a bear market, the miners would slip. Now they would come back real quickly and so would gold, but there would be a short period in there where they would slip. Um, would you expect that if we keep on going lower this year in the S&P? Well, mining stocks are stocks. And so they're different than gold, even though they are very closely linked over let's say an intermediate to longer term. Um, if you go back to the great financial crisis in 07, 08, gold stocks performed poorly, um, but once they turn on the spigots of monetary creation, the gold stocks were the first thing out of the box um, and did very well. Now, it's a little bit different now because I think the gold stocks are uh, very, very cheap. They trade at very low multiples of cash flow, um, almost any metric you can think of. So yeah, could there be downside? Um, sure, because uh, we're in a bear market um, and they are stocks. But um, when this pivot comes, which I'm anticipating, I think they will rocket higher uh, on a higher gold price. And, and you, uh, you also have a slide though about how deeply valued they are relative to the bullion. Now, I hadn't right. seen that slide before. It's interesting. We've got it. We'll show it here. But that's a, that's a fairly wide spread between normal valuation on the miners and where they are right now. Yeah, they're very cheap relative to bullion, as the slide indicates. They're cheap relative to other stocks. Um, we have a slide that shows that. Um, and um, I think it's worth noting that um, that uh, 
it's it's cheaper to buy a gold mining company in the market than it is for than it is to start from scratch. Um, so the discount uh, is operating businesses to uh, historical values is unprecedented in my time in doing this, which is now going on 20 plus years. So you've never seen it that deep? Never seen uh, these valuations like that. And, and going back to your point about how would they do in a continuing bear market, um, you have to concede that they are stocks, but I do think that their downside risk is, is somewhat tempered by the strong valuations that they show. And again, um, I think if you wait for the Fed to pivot, you won't be able to accumulate a position. You need to be there and maybe uh, ride with them during this sort of buildup, this basing period, which I think is where they are, they're basing, um, without a huge amount of downside, um, to participate in, in what I think will be uh, substantial upside when the Fed changes its tune. So uh, let's give people, you've got some great information on just the basics of true gold. Uh, discovery, and I'll take the first one, which is discovery and production. Um, it looks like what you're saying is that we're just discovering less gold. That's for sure. Yeah, all, everything points to that. And there are lots of reasons for it, but the fact of the matter is that um, we are uh, finding less and less gold that can be mined at today's prices. And when you look at, when you mention the lives at less than, or about 30 years, is that the lowest you've ever seen it? The, the life of a yeah, mine? The, the mine life uh, uh, of, of, of the reserve life of the existing global stock of production is the shortest it's been in 30 years. And that keeps and that keeps getting so when you so we've talking we've been talking mainly about macro uh, considerations, but um, on a supply and demand basis, we have shrinking supply, um, while at the same time you have the potential for substantial increase in demand um, at the retail level and the institutional level um, when the Fed turns. And so you're, you, as a follow-up to that, you also have, a, you have your show, this piece here, we're showing that on uh, where it basically is setting up people where they rather buy the mines than develop the mines or buy versus build. Uh, do right. I read you right on that? That's correct. Yeah, it's cheaper to, cheaper to buy existing production. Now this, this is, when you think about M&A and the mining business, um, it's cheaper for a big company to buy a, a medium-sized company than to, than to spend money exploring um, and then building a mine that might not come into production for another seven or eight years. And so when you look at um, your primary fund, the Sprott Gold Equities Fund, for example, do you own up and down the spectrum, large, junior, bullion, everything? Yes. Yeah, we own, we own the whole A to, A to Z in terms of what could be out there. But we, um, I think if you look at our average market cap, it's around a billion and a half, which would tell us we're sort of mid cap, but we do have large cap names and we have small cap names. And you mentioned too, along this same line, the, the, the buy is easier than build, that you have a new, that you think there's a new merger acquisition cycle underway. You might talk about that. Yeah, for sure. We're seeing a lot of m and um, some good, some not so good. Um, and we try, and one thing we do uh, in screening our, our, our portfolio is make sure um, that management knows what it's doing in an M&A sequence. But, but there's no doubt that there is a lot of consolidation taking place. And again, that's something you see at the bottom of the cycle, not at the top. What, what, do, what do you look for or what should they look for 
in a in a gold mining stock that they're, they're wanting to buy that might be a takeout candidate, for example. But are they looking at length of mines, new production, cash flow? How do they fit I that? Got, yeah, a, a lot of those things. I think asset quality is one thing. Um, another uh, development that's taken place over the last 10 years or so is is jurisdictional risk. Um, we have about half of our uh, underlying assets are in North America, which has a rule of law. We have another large exposure in Australia. Uh, and then the rest of the world, we're pretty picky about just Africa, you can't avoid because they have great geology and we we uh, screen countries based on political risk. But that's a big factor in, in our selection process. Interesting. Uh, and you you do own a percentage in the bullion too, am I correct? We have about 11% uh, last uh, count uh, exposed to physical metal. So let me switch gears uh, and talk about, you know, the, the if you look at equity ownership um, at all time highs, which we, by the way, we happen to totally agree with that it's, uh, you get these two sigmas or two, you know, one or two standard deviation above and we we really sort of feel the same way about real estate that it would it would be the next trouble as well but but uh, if you have a great slide on equity ownership uh at, at all time highs and the percent of households and where they are but obviously they are all in on this equity side unfortunately that's true they don't they, they, they don't not only don't seem to they actually absolutely do not and they've been brainwashed. I think uh, the media does a good job of it, uh, steering people away from uh, owning anything gold related. And then part of that is that it is not, the reason it's not in the mainstream is that um, the rationale for having any exposure at all is always taken to be some kind of a negative view on the consensus view of the world, which is rose, rose colored glasses, and a bullish um, stock market outlook. So you, you've had a chance to be at all the gold highs all along, at least since I've been in yeah, business. And, so, and the lows. Yeah, <laughs> but on the highs, what was the sentiment like? Say the late 70s, early 80s, 2011, what, was, was everybody wanting gold? What, what was yeah. that sentiment like? Yeah, absolutely, it was euphoria. Uh, it was front page stuff. Um, if you go back to um, 2011, when gold ticked at 1900 and something, uh, and then never saw that for another 10 years, it was front page news. The Financial Times talked about it almost on a daily basis. And you don't see that now. Well, I know, um, and you will probably get some comments on this question, but uh, uh, you know, you have a lot of people talking about the fact, that, oh, you need these cryptos because they'll be a lot better heads than gold. But that has not been a proven, uh, proven situation so far. And uh, it seems like gold, if you really want to go for a hedge, you be you need to be looking at gold instead of something like a crypto or something, which obviously okay. it is getting wiped out right now. You have to be a little careful, uh, but the world of crypto is hurting right now. Uh, and I'm not saying that crypto doesn't have merit, um, and it's been a great investment. Lately, it hasn't been. Um, and the rationale for being there is very similar to the thought process for gold. But um, at least now, and for the last couple of years, crypto has been correlated very closely with uh, high-tech stocks, the FANG group, and so forth. Um, so, uh, until that correlation breaks down, I don't think it's a good diversifier. So question for you along that line of people, for example, and I'd like for them to know this, you have a really good slide on the downside equity protection, uh, average monthly return showing gold versus a lot of other things. I mean, it goes all the way down to the Russell and the MSCI. Uh, that is really a great, a great slide. You might talk about that. I think that's 20 years worth maybe. Yeah, it should be 20 years, um, and it probably would go for longer than that. I can't remember exactly what the chart shows in terms of time span, but over history, gold has 
uh, been low, has very low correlation with financial assets, bonds and stocks. So it is a true diversifier. And that means it may not always go up when other things are going up, but when other things are going down, it holds its own and may even go up. And you know, uh, I've never seen this done before, but you put together a great slide here called, for people that, and a lot of them, like we talked about, don't have any gold in the portfolio. Uh, obviously at Oxbow we do, we have the miners and the bullion, but the thing about it is you have a great slide that t looks at a standard 60-40 stock bond portfolio and what happens to that, and you've done a historical on it, if you add 10% gold. You see, it, it certainly enhances returns. I can't remember the exact number, but it definitely... Uh, um, well, it was a big number because you went from uh, basically, if you want to look at risk versus total return, um, you know, at, over a 20-year period, uh, you, you basically beat the 60-40 by uh, annualized 10%, more than that. What, by that, I mean from 4, 450 and 418 or something like that to 454, which is, right. you know, a big number in the business. Uh, when you get right, to, and that's not a big shift. I mean, you're just adding like 10%. I found that interesting. It's not. It's not like you're betting the ranch. Yeah, but it's a prudent way to protect capital. You know, another interesting point to make here is that bonds have traditionally been the diversifier against so a 60/40 portfolio. Institutionally, was always the way you mitigate against risk, but that hasn't worked because. When, when you had zero interest rates and now we're at, say, on the 10-year, we're now at 3%, bonds have gotten killed. I hate to say it, but they just have gotten killed. So bonds have not been a good diversifier, at least in recent years. And, you know, so people always ask rhetorically, where do you go for safety? Where do you go to protect capital? But you never hear anybody, certainly in the financial media, say, well, how about gold? You never, almost never hear it on Fox, MSNBC, uh, CNBC, and so forth. No, it's a, Bloomberg. Even I mean, it's like it's doesn't exist. Yeah, you never hear, uh, and it's almost like if they do have somebody on or they talk to them a little bit, uh, they're like, they, they, well, <laughs> they, they get no airtime. Uh, -uh. We we. We found this cat over here that has gold, but we're going to listen to him for a few minutes, but not very long. <laughs> you know, I haven't gotten a lot of calls from the financial media lately, but I'll tell you, back in back 10, 15 years ago, I was getting a lot of calls to be on Bloomberg and uh, Charlie Rose, and, uh, you know, there was, there was just much more interest. There is zero interest now. So let me ask you, um, if somebody has no gold, and a lot of people watch this that we don't manage for, but uh, not that we wouldn't want to, but uh, but the main point, if somebody shows up today and they own uh, zero gold, and obviously they can buy your Sprott fund and real, be highly diversified, but what percentage would you tell them, if I've got a 100% stock and bond portfolio, no, no gold presentation at all, what would you tell them would be a fairly decent number to start with, percentage-wise? Yeah, you know, I would always advise someone to leg in and not go all out. But ultimately, uh, I would think you would want to build your um, accumulation to f at least five percent, because otherwise, you know, if you keep it at like one or two percent, it's like kissing your sister. Um, on the other hand, you know, five percent could actually do you some good, and as our charts have shown 10% really is a reasonable exposure. I wouldn't recommend more than that. But I would say here at a time when there's zero interest in our space, and you know, given um, a contrarian uh, point of view, uh, why not why not just uh, dip your toe in the water at one or 2%. And, and I, I don't know, you may, I'm sure you know this, but I don't know what the percentage is of the S&P 500 that are gold miners, but it has to be. It's, it's less than 1%. Really? Oh yeah, no, I mean, there are probably only one or two names I can think of. It might not even be 1%. Huh. That's interesting. So there's a lot of room to run there. Yeah, I mean, it's not gonna ever be 10%, but um, 
it could be two or three percent, which would be from where we are, could be a double or a triple. Well, you remember uh, just two years ago when energy was not even represented was, hardly. Exactly. <laughs> that was, an, I mean, sure. Energy was, again, it was not invited to the party and look where it is today. So uh, we're going to, uh, at the end here, everyone, you'll see uh, how to get in touch with John and also the Sprock Group. Uh, obviously, you've been around a long time. There's a lot of really professional people there. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say tons of them, but the ones are there. I only want great minds. I, if Two or three are fine for me, John. You're, you're one you of them. You don't need more than that. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> and you, you know, as you probably forgot more about gold than most people know. So it's really interesting to me uh, what, what, how you manage that and what goes on with that. But I would highly recommend people to to take a look at they can they can come to your website which we'll show here and uh, get any information they need you'll find a lot of great things in there um, I, I would ask you one more question that really um, is sort of a time we're in you know you and I both know Neil Howe and the fourth turning and sort of what goes on in those yes. crazy periods I think, I think we heard him speak at a recent conference we were at yeah we did and he didn't change his tune any about the next 10 years but uh, question for you wouldn't you think that gold if you get into these really really crazy times where you have upheavals various things even in the US uh, wouldn't you think it would really become, you know, the asset of choice at that point? Well, it certainly would come out of the doghouse. Um, and I, I hate to predicate interest in gold based on worst outcomes that we all know are there. Uh, but I'll let other people do that. But certainly uh, you can say that gold has been in the penalty box for the last 10 years. And if... Um, we get into some kind of fourth turning where we have unexpected outcomes. Um, I would certainly think that having some exposure to gold isn't going to hurt you. And um, as you've seen over the last 20 years, if you had it, it didn't kill your performance. Maybe in some years it did, but it didn't over a long span. It didn't. Um, so, right. If, if we if we go into a world uh, of unexpected outcomes, uh, a, a financial reset, as some people like to say, gold is certainly going to come out at the, you know, at least near the top of the heap. And one last question to you, which is a question that we get at Oxbow all the time. <laughs> I mean, this question is continually coming to us, which is, should I, if I'm an investor, should I have gold bullion delivered to me to hold? No. Because you're, that means you're self-insuring, and uh, I think the risk of having bullion in your somewhere in your house and your safe or whatever, um, it doesn't really uh, get you that much. There are better options, and I would just mention among them would be Sprott's gold equity, uh, not the equity fund, but the gold closed-end uh, gold trust. Uh, where if you wanted it to be delivered to your doorstep, we would do that. But it, in, otherwise, it's sitting safely in the uh, uh, Bank of Canada vaults. Um, and it's traded publicly. Uh, very little, uh, it's a closed-end fund, so the, the, there's a very small premium or discount. Um, and in my mind, that's, it's not the only solution but I think it's better than having it shipped to your doorstep. Yeah, because uh, you know somebody could come and get that too. <laughs> well, that's the that that's right, and you can't transact in it. I mean, you're gonna, not going to lug a bullion bar down to your bank and expect to get. You know, they're going to have to ship it to a, um, a refiner to make sure that its purity is is correct, and it could take you two or three weeks or more to get cash. So it's not transactable. Whereas if you have it in the closed-in uh, physical trust of Sprott, uh, you can buy and sell like, an, like a stock, but it's, it is gold. Well, listen, John, I wanna tell you, it's been our pleasure to have you here today. And on, on the screen, you can see, people can see how to get in touch with you, find out a lot about what you do. 
I think, you know, one of the things I find uh, in the industry is that you want the people uh, that have been around a while. Uh, and if, um, that. well, if, if Warren okay. Buffett, if Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are any example, you've got a long way to go, my friend. I'm counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John, thanks a lot, and we hope to have you back next year if you don't mind. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Thanks a okay. lot. See you then.